Good morning, everybody. You know, it's, it's funny. Uh, I literally should be the last person standing here today uh, speaking to you. I'm shy. I'm an introvert. I tend to avoid large events like this one. And at heart, I think I epitomize that word, B-O-R-I-N-G, boring. But, you know, coming into the close of, of 2021, I find myself in a very strange but a really exciting place. So first off, I'm the CEO of this company that's got a great uh, regional lineage, 155 plus years, doing great things for society. It's got a great team tied to it. And then I'm also at the same time passionately advocating. And what am I passionately advocating for? An industry that from my perspective is vilified uh, a lot and oftentimes by enemies on the left and in the environmental movement who are spreading all kinds of, of mistruths with impunity. And I'm also publishing a book, and the book is coming out pretty soon, January 17th. The title's Precipice, The Left's Campaign to Destroy America. And what the book is about is exploring how doers and value creators in the real economy, how they're being squeezed and bled and they see their value being appropriated more and more by an elite bureaucratic class that embraces leftist ideology. So you can order the book on, on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and indie books, and I encourage you to do so, not because I'm looking to make a buck off of this. I'm going to donate all the net proceeds to the CNX Foundation. Uh, the CNX Foundation is doing all kinds of awesome work on a philanthropic front uh, regionally. Now, not because I'm looking to make money off of this, but instead, I feel that it's a rallying cry and an ardent defense of every man, woman, and business in this industry, in this region. I also publish a podcast. It uh, comes out every week on Wednesdays. It's titled The Far Middle, as in not the far left and not the far right, but the far middle, get it? Uh, runs for about a half an hour per episode, discusses timely topics that are either important or threatening to the middle class, to this region, our industry, free enterprise and individual rights. And unfortunately, I'm here to tell you there's a lot to cover and I'm constantly backlogged with content. Uh, you can tune into the far middle on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Amazon Music. Give it a listen. Uh, you might enjoy some of what you hear. And then I'm on Twitter. And from time to time, I will attract some fire from the environmentalists and the leftists and the value appropriators. And I figure I might be doing something right, maybe when that happens. But you can follow me there on Twitter at Nick Deolius. And all of this, whether it's the, the book precipice, the far middle podcast, what's going on with Twitter, uh, you can find all of that on my website, nickdeolius.com, where I'm regularly posting new commentaries, and I'll cover anything from business to energy, sports, entertainment, uh, history. I have a lot of fun with it, and I hope you enjoy some of it. So we made tracking all of this easy today. Um, you can use your smartphones to link it all together. If you text the word Doug East, all one word, to the number 52886, you'll get a reply text and you'll get a link where you can find all this information that I had just listed. So text in Doug East to 52886 and that'll lay it all out for you. So why am I doing all this? Um, I do it out of love and passion for specific stakeholders. And I just use the word stakeholders that I, I despise. I'm guilty of it. I just used it myself in a speech. But stakeholders that matter tremendously and who are under attack and sometimes they don't even realize it. This talk, like the book and the website, it's targeted to that same specific audience. So who are these stakeholders? I think they fall into two broad categories. Um, first category, the people of Appalachia. So when I speak to Appalachia, I'm talking about, of course, Western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Western Virginia, Eastern Ohio, and specifically three subgroups within the people of Appalachia. First, small, mid, and large business owners. Okay, they're the ones who are creating value in the free market. They're competing every day to make payroll and improve society. Capitalism, I'm here to assure you it works. And Milton Friedman, he was absolutely right. Second subgroup within the people of Appalachia, the middle class. From my perspective, that's the singular, most important thing that made this region and this country great and something that's methodically being eroded away, sometimes intentionally, by the hard left, by the environmental movement, by the administrative state, and by elite academia at times. And then the third subgroup within the people of Appalachia 
our neighbors that I'm thinking about uh, living in underserved zip codes, and particularly here thinking about kids, young adults in urban and rural zip codes who are looking to do what? Well, they're basically looking to catapult themselves into the middle class, but they face more and more headwinds in doing so from government policy and the system, both of which at times feels like they're designed to keep them from arriving at the promised land of self-sufficiency and opportunity and fulfilling career paths. Now, the second group of stakeholders in the audience that I'm targeting are people of the energy industry. And here I'm talking about the real energy industry, okay, and natural gas and pipelines and petrochemicals, not the make-believe energy industry of so-called renewables and subsidy and zero carbon mythology. I'm talking about people on pad who never missed a beat working through COVID, true doers, right, in every sense of the word. I'm talking about people just starting out their careers in this region and in these great industries, making sure that they've got the opportunity and the option to, to navigate through a full and a memorable career. And I'm talking about people who serve as the sages and real leaders in the ranks. So not necessarily the C-suite and those carpet land cushy offices like myself in Pittsburgh or Houston or New York or wherever, but instead I'm talking about the ones who are running to the problem because they see it as an opportunity. Um, the ones who seem to be constantly talking to individual after individual. There's a line of individuals outside their, their office, their trailer, their shed, because everyone knows that they're the go-to leaders. And I see a lot of you out there in the audience today. I love all these people. And that doesn't mean, by the way, I necessarily like all of them, okay? Truth be told, I can't stand certain people I might've grown up with or work with in this industry, but nevertheless, I love them because in many ways, you know, if you're from here or if you work in energy or if you are a true doer, that love is gonna be unconditional. So my objective today is what? It's to crystallize. And crystallize what? Well, I wanna crystallize what's going on with the stakeholder game board. And there I did it twice. I used stakeholder twice in the speech. But that stakeholder game board uh, in our region and in our industry. And maybe it's a bit depressing that such a talk such as this is needed in 2021 or late 2021. But unfortunately, the current situation this region and industry finds itself in it's evolved under a campaign where the reality is shrouded purposely by those looking to replace it with the mirage. So people and entities, they're saying it's all about one thing, but it's about something else altogether. I see them, I want you to see them as well, and I wanna start a conversation about where we go from here. And again, you can text Doug East at 52886 to get that conversation going. So first, let's just talk a couple of minutes about that opposition. The public criticism, uh, the strident attacks on us. And when I say us, who am I referring to? I'm talking about natural gas, domestic oil, pipelines, petrochemicals, combined cycle, power plants, home gas hookups, and so on. I'm talking about all the stuff that brings quality of life to people across the globe. And it's a mistake to stereotype our opposition because those who oppose our awesomeness they're not a homogeneous group. There are three categories of this opposition and elite critic class. And in the first group are entities that look to some manufactured fear or concern with what we do in domestic energy. And they then use that as justification to create new rules and regulation and work and markets to basically make money off of. Now these entities, they can be multi-billion dollar corporations using mandates and tax credits to build wind farms to nowhere. These entities can be research arms of universities spending billions of your taxpayer dollars on studies aimed to, what's that expression, tackle climate change. And these entities can be global certification and trading platforms to run processes where they skim a little bit off of the top as a fee. And these entities are basically engaging in a form of what the lovable but the corrupt politician George Washington Plunkett back in Tammany Hall days in old New York City, what he used to call honest graft. It's building and using a constructed problem to justify a solution that's gonna create subsidy or protected market for these entities to make money off of. And these groups or individuals, they don't really hate us, but for them, it's just business. And it's the business of finding a rationale to take a dollar from you, from us, and putting it indirectly into their pocket. 
It's capitalism when you think about it, but it's capitalism by wealth redistribution and controlled markets versus what we do, which is capitalism by innovation in free markets. Now in the second group of the opposition, there you're gonna find entities that are looking to paint us in a poor light, or as a problem that needs fixed or protected from to justify more revenue or more authority or to feed uh, whatever bureaucracy or institution is hungry and needs fed more. And I can assure you in many instances, those appetites are gonna be voracious. Now government, of course, falls into this category. It can be state governments like our own in Pennsylvania as an impact fees and severance taxes. And you can call it a severance tax or you can call it an impact fee. It's, it's all in the same, uh, all one in the same. But feeding those types of things to go toward government programs and unfunded pensions and bureaucracy, et cetera. It can be the federal government. It can be in the form of methane fees or carbon taxes to plug what are just growing and growing uh, budget deficit spending or to service, and it's hard to believe I'm gonna say this, but it's, it's the fact, to service almost $30 trillion in federal debt. Or it can be increasingly, we see this, right? The global governments is in climate accords and all those money flows going back and forth between nations to plug unsustainable fiscal gaps. You saw thousands of leaders from this group off in Glasgow at the UN Climate Confab. And what were they doing? They were spewing very little logic, but a lot of carbon dioxide. So this group, you know, they may say they dislike us, the second group of opposition, but in the end, I don't think they do because at heart, the politician or the bureaucrat, they're going to shift to match the prevailing winds of, of opportunity. It's about money, it's about balancing budgets, and saving the planet or atmospheric CO2 in 50 years, that oftentimes is gonna be pretense, along with that famous banner of serving the public good. Now there's a third subcategory of our opposition group, and here sits the true believer. Here you're gonna find the religious zealot and the oppressive extremist who worships at the altar of climate and places the earth ahead of the human, the collective in front of the individual, and the ideology in front of the math and the science. Now for this group, it ain't about money, it ain't about plugging, gaping funding gaps, it's about eradicating us in what we do and our region's way of life. They want what you do killed off and the collateral damage and consequences be damned. What you do is evil, and it needs to be destroyed. Here, the hate is gonna be true and the vilification is gonna be real. So these are the people and the entities that make outrageous claims, like how our industry poisons children, how we destroy the planet, how we oppress the poor. These are horrendous claims to make, yet all of the wild accusations, they face no consequences, and that has to end. So this group is not one to take lightly, it's not one to try to negotiate or reason with. It's a win-lose proposition. The conflict and fight will certainly not go away. You can't run from it, and you're gonna to need to face it head on. Appeasement is not gonna work any better here than it did for Neville Chamberlain in the 1930s. And ironically, this group feels a lot like religious extremism because in many ways, it's a religion and the zealotry that goes with it. So like a lot of religions in history, and unfortunately my own of Catholicism, you saw that uh, with how they dealt with Galileo back in the day. The extreme fringe of the religion will have science commandeered to fit the faithful cause, or it's gonna have science run over. So can anybody out there say denier? And you know what's interesting when you think about it, if I were to put a big cross or religious symbol around my neck and go out on Liberty Avenue and say that the end of days are near, most people would look at me and call me a religious nut. But if I become secular, you take away the religious symbolism, and I go out and say the end of days are near, they're gonna call me an environmentalist. And if I do a really good job of it, I might get promoted into something like a climate czar. So now let's, let's shift from the opposition, let's shift to our industry in our region and why sometimes, sometimes, leaders out there fail to defend what we do on behalf of society. They fail to advocate for our industries and they fail to take a logical yet public stand on energy matters. And when I say leaders, some of the time, they can be those in those carpet world uh, top floors that I spoke about, sometimes trade organizations, depending on the facts and circumstances, sometimes regional politicians, and not all the time and not everyone, but sometimes, and sometimes at crucial moments. Basically, I'm talking about people who have a responsibility to lead or a duty to know, but sometimes they fail to do so. 
So why the reluctance with some of our leaders to tell it like it is? Well, the leader, depending on who and the circumstances, may be solving for something different than what we are all interested in solving for. Perhaps a subset of our leaders are first and foremost concerned about themselves, and the duty of leadership has been jettisoned. The concern of the leader might be centric to perhaps image and personal brand, or popularity in political and elite circles, or net worth, or holding on to your job for as long as you can. And sometimes maybe the company doesn't come first, or the employees, or the region, or the owners, or the customers. Sometimes at the top, the tagline is you exist for the team, but the reality is you think the team exists for you. And another motivator for this failure of leadership at certain times with certain individuals may be fear. And what type of fear? Well, it could be fear of not being liked. It could be fear of a fight. It could be fear of work. So placating, appeasement, herd talk, herd mentality, so hello stakeholder and sustainable and zero carbon and ESG, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are easy and you may get to avoid the confrontation at least for a while, but not forever. That's why too many of our leaders won't engage in battle when we need all of them more than ever. And am I being too harsh with this assessment? Ask yourself this. If a business or a political or a religious or a mentor leader says they're about the team, that the employees and the citizens and the flock are the most valuable asset, that the region they operate in is sacrosanct, that science matters and so on, then why don't we see more Wait a minute, check that. Why don't we see every, every leader stepping up and taking on known falsehoods and accusations? Because something either is more important to them and or because they're afraid of the consequences of doing so. So do we do nothing? Heck no, right? There's too much at stake for everybody. The answer, I think, is to give and get. And what do I mean by give and get? I'm basically talking about a new social contract between our industry and our region, one where science prevails, Facts reign supreme and the extremists are marginalized. Where the individual thrives and the free market dictates the winners and losers, not the faceless system or bureaucrat. Now on the give side, we can do better. We need to do better, frankly, as an industry. And how? Let me propose four ideas. We plan on rolling out more details on each of these in the coming weeks. And obviously we want to engage the industry and the leaders in the industry about them, but in the stakeholder groups, I'll use that term again, um, but here are the four, at least preliminarily. First idea on how we up our game and, uh, and get better as an industry. Impact fee severance tax. Exceeded $2 billion cumulatively this past summer. It's been a huge benefit to a bunch of entities in the Commonwealth. Do you know of any other industry that's paid more of a fair share than we have in the past 10 years in this state? Because I don't. Act 13 laid out the impact fee here in Pennsylvania. It's now 10 years old, that's hard to believe and it's time for a refresh. The industry's changed dramatically in that time from an efficiency standpoint. Let's revisit this and update it based on the current state. There's a way where we thrive more, the industry and the region and the state gets more, I believe that. Second idea of up in our game, transparency and accuracy in environmental reporting. Look, they're the new norms for our industry. Why not make it an industry standard to inject a rigor with regulatory reporting for environmental metrics that meets what public companies require for financial reporting. We've already done this at CNX. We'll openly, openly share our processes and structures with any peer, large or small, public or private, doesn't matter. We'll share with any peer who's interested in upping their regulatory accuracy and game. We all win to the extent that we do that. Third idea, this is a big one. How about doing better on how and who we hire as employees and contract service providers across our links of the, the industry chain? What if we target exclusively local regional hires? What if we commit to more building trades partners, spend a lot of time with the building trades, I'm a big proponent of them, they manufacture, they mint professionals. You wouldn't have surgery done by anybody, you would want a board certified MD. You wouldn't have anyone represent you in court, you would want a bar member to, to represent you in court, why would it be any different when we're building our state-of-the-art facilities and maintaining them? What if we also target within our local and uh, regional spend individuals and companies from those socioeconomically underserved communities that I spoke about, the urban and the rural ones? 
if you think about it, we talk a lot in this industry and across all of business, rightfully so, about diversity. But what I'm talking about in a way is being geographically non-diverse by hiring and spending exclusively in the regions that we operate within. And then within that setting those tangible targets that we would hit when it comes to focusing the hiring and spend in the underserved communities. If you do that, it's a statistical certainty that physical diversity is going to improve substantially. Fourth and last idea, how about us taking a proactive leading stance on plugging the thousands of abandoned wells in the state and region? Now that's a problem, and I know that you didn't cause that, and you know that I didn't cause that, but what does leadership in an industry represent? I think it represents leading on removing a risk so that everybody benefits. Now, on the get side, what would we get in return under this, this new social contract? I think we should demand also four things. And the good news is they reflect true science and reason. You could argue we shouldn't even be asking for this, they should just be a given. But nevertheless, here's four ideas that we would get to couple with those four gives that I just covered. No gets, then no gives, and sadly, no middle. First, an acceptance by all that every form of energy, every economic endeavor, could be in this city, this region, this state, nation, world, doesn't matter, has a carbon footprint. There is no such thing as zero carbon for scopes one through three, net or gross, today or tomorrow, and not wind or solar by long shots. It's a scientific fact, and it's time for anyone who wants to voice an opinion when it comes to energy policy to acknowledge it or be ignored as someone who's too ignorant to be taken seriously. Second, get. Streamlining and supporting, and I mean actually supporting, real support for pipeline construction, natural gas combined cycle power generation, petrochemicals, residential and business natural gas hookups. More natural gas demand is good for climate, good for jobs, good for GDP, good for business owners, good for state tax revenues, including the severance and impact fees. Our public servants, uh, they should be completely aligned with us on this. If they're not, then something other than the science and the best interest of their constituents is taking priority. Third idea for a get for our industry and thus our region, advocacy. Advocacy from who? Advocacy from our leaders in industry and in politics within this region and in academia to take on those shrill voices in places like New York or Massachusetts who vilify this industry, they work to stop interstate commerce, and they're doing so under those false banners of saving the world and looking after the public good. So would Massachusetts, whether it's mayors in its big cities or its senators down in DC advocates for, helps Putin, hurts Western Pennsylvania. What Cuomo and de Blasio wanted, and thank God I can use the past tense with both of them, helps China, hurts Bradford, Pennsylvania. What President Biden and Congresswoman AOC clamor for helps socialism in the left, hurts Appalachia in the individual. Our Pennsylvania and industry leadership, they need to defend this region and industry's interests when we're threatened by nonsensical ideological, regulatory, or financial attack from others. And then the fourth get, eliminating protected markets and subsidy for things like expensive, unreliable, foreign wind and solar. As I said, they have huge carbon footprints on a scope one through three basis. They make budget gaps of municipalities and school districts and states and nations worse. The middle class and working poor bear the brunt of those costs, both direct and indirect. And all the material and most of the components are gonna to have to be mined, processed, and manufactured out of state, oftentimes in places like China. These mandates are a losing formula, and they're a losing formula of larger carbon footprint, plus increased costs, plus outsourcing energy independence to nations applying human rights abuses like China. And I'm trying to be respectful here, but it's a strategic blunder bordering on stupidity for the United States to implement policy that looks to outsource its energy independence to our global rivals and then hope that those rivals don't use it against us time and time again. And by the way, if blood diamonds or clothing made in sweatshops bother you, as they should, then you're going to hate the thought of wind and solar made from the brutalization of minorities and dissidents in China. Now these four gives and four gets help bring us closer together with two of those three opposition groups I've talked about. The honest graft crowd, the government crowd should act rationally, move to the middle where we'll meet them. Not all of them, but a lot of them. We move closer to the center, they move closer to the center, everybody wins the far middle. 
And it also helps inform on various policies. So if you take something like Reggie, if you're interested in a commonwealth and its people, under the proposed give and gets I just laid out, Reggie dies a well-deserved death. Same with the still official policy of the Democratic Party in the state of supporting a fracking ban. Reasonable individuals interested in this region and its people, and I consider many Democrats to fit that description, they know that stance is ridiculous. Let's assign it to the trash bin. So what's the bottom line? I think the theme is one of defending, defending yourself, your peers, your neighbors, your industry, your region, and yes, ultimately your country. Let's not allow our leaders to keep apologizing for what we do. It's the only industry in history that willingly publicly concedes the moral and scientific high ground to those looking to do it harm via fantasy and mistruth. The science says we're the present and the future. The moral imperative is for societies to embrace our industries and products, not get rid of them. And the competitive realities tell us without natural gas in its affiliated industries, our nation is in big trouble. And by the way, without a competitive free market and capitalism dictating winners in a developing world, it never develops and its billions of souls continue to suffer. Who wants that? Be an educated advocate, own up on the math and the science and the facts. Talk to your leaders in your respective companies. Ask them to shun short-termism. Lobby them to engage in this fight in a meaningful way. They've got a duty to do so. And contact your elected officials. Respectfully advocate for common sense public policy. Um, let them know and thank those who support our industry that, that they, they were right in doing so, if nothing else, to let them know that we're paying attention uh, to what they're doing. It's been a pleasure uh, being with you this morning. I thank you for your time. Hey, go out and pre-order Precipice. I think you'll enjoy a lot of it. You can contact me on Twitter, check out the website, and I hope to see you out there on the front lines of public discourse, and I hope to join you in the far middle. Thank you.